Thursday morning wasn't the, um, the morning that I was expecting to have. Um, normally on a Thursday morning I pop off up to St Albans uh, up in Pontypool and celebrate a voluntary mass um, with the young people uh, in the school before coming back uh, down to the parish for the parish mass. And as I got into the car and I left the car park here, I knew that something was a little bit wrong um, with the car because it wasn't doing what it normally does. Only to discover that when I got out of the car that I have yet again got a flat tire. And this time I'd ripped the whole of the side of my tire. Unfortunately, it was totally uh, my fault, I've come to admit. So I'm going to say that now, because only, only in December I replaced this tyre with a new one. So that put the kibosh on going up to St Albans. And so I had a friend of mine uh, uh, drive me round all of Thursday morning. And before you ask, yes, I sat in the back. Yes, I waved as I, walked, as, as I drove past. So don't worry. And one of the appointments I had is I had, of course, to go... Uh, into St. David's to speak to one of the teachers. And so I walked through the gates of St. David's and it was so lovely to see uh, the different year groups, the different parts of the school community using the vast outdoor space uh, that they have over there. There was one class was doing an exercise as part of the, the, their well-being week, their wellness week, and they were, I was quite jealous, they were toasted marshmallows uh, on a fire. So I was, quite, I was quite envious of that. There was another class then out in the distance they were playing and they were having their playtime. And then there was another class again, year six in fact, were doing a little bit of drama uh, outside their classroom. They were only doing a bit of Shakespeare of course. They were acting out a bit of a Midsummer Night's Dream, a nice easy topic. And, and so there was a, a lovely vibe going on. So I went in and spoke to the, uh, the teacher, slightly wound the children up, as you can imagine that I would do, and then I left quite happily. And as I was leaving, I met um, a, a, a relatively new teacher who, um, in passing, and this teacher introduced herself to me, and she was saying to me that out of all the places that she's ever worked um, in her career as a teacher, that St. David's uh, brought with it something special, something unique with it. So we had a chat and I asked her, I said, you know, can you pinpoint what that is? What is it that makes it so special? And as she was chatting, she was drawn to the spiritual and the moral grounding of our young people. She said, there's something in that spiritual and moral formation which is unique to, to the other the state schools that she's worked in. Celebrating the virtues, in particular, she said, gives them a grounding for life which impacts upon all of their lives for all of the children. Those virtues, the, the pupil profile some of our parents might recognize uh, that as. And I, I thought to myself, isn't this lovely to hear at first hand? And it's a blessing that the hard work of our teachers and parents does indeed bear fruit. That there is a worth of instilling in our young children that there is a positive impact that living the virtues has for ourselves and also for the wider community because people notice a difference, people know a change. And another parent recently was talking to me about St. Albans, saying something very similar, uh, that our children um, come with them with something different. And so as we move to this section of um, the gospel then, this portion, if you like, of the Sermon of the, on the Mount, Jesus picks out some of those 10 commandments from um, the Old Testament. And he encourages his disciples, and so as a consequence, he encourages each and every one of us to be virtuous. To be virtuous, in other words, to live a life of virtue. 
To, be a, to live a life of virtue is a fundamental principle of the Christian life. And we can't detach living the, a life of virtue from our own Christian vocation. And so it is right and proper that we as a parish, as a school family, as a diocesan community, should teach and instruct our young people to live a life of virtue. That's why they reflect upon it every term. They reflect upon two new virtues in all of our schools and looking at how these can impact in their everyday lives. It's a fundamental principle of the Christian life because it directs us to God. It's the habitual disposition to the good, says the Catechism, that which directs us beyond ourselves to God. Living a life of virtue isn't something that's broad and abstract. It's not something which is detached from reality, something sort of out there to aspire to, but we never quite get to. Rather, it's deeply rooted in our life itself. And can't we see this play out in the gospel as our Lord takes those Ten Commandments and applies them and reflects upon them within the context of everyday life? John Paul II once reminded us that virtue has an impact on a man's life, on his actions, and on his behavior, because it brings about a change in us. It moves us to a different point, and that's good. It's good that it changes us. If we are truly to make our discipleship intentional, in other words, if we are to take our vocations as disciples seriously, then striving to live a life of virtue will, as a consequence, impact upon our lives and impact upon the decisions that we make, our ability to make those good choices, just as we instill in our young people through our schools. And as that teacher demonstrated to me this week, that when we do this, and when we allow these virtues to live out and to shine and to be celebrated, as I know they do in our schools, its impact is felt in a real tangible way. You can feel it because faith and a life of virtue is attractive. And so as we begin to look towards the season of Lent, can you believe already, the readings offer us that chance to sort of lay the groundwork, if you like, to, to give us a chance to begin to go deeper, to delve deeper with our faith and the way in which our faith is lived out in the world. A good place to begin is to ask ourselves, what in the life of virtue is something that challenges me? What is it that challenges? Do we find difficult? To begin to answer this, is to recognize that a life of virtue isn't merely about avoiding those do's and don'ts as we find in the, the great list in the Old Testament. It pertains to our flourishing. It pertains to becoming the best version of ourselves, to be the people God has created us to be and nothing less. Because faith is an encounter with the living God not merely the conformity to a sets of rules and regulations. And what I found interesting that as I was looking for the definition of virtue yesterday in the Catechism, the definition comes with a quote by one of the early fathers of the church, Gregory of Nyssa, who says that the goal of the virtuous life is to become like God. What a goal to present to us, isn't it? Or what um, something to aspire to. Of course, the secular world, the, the godless world, may offer us an alternative picture and may present to us this alternative picture as the right way, the positive way, that what we hold to be true, good, and beautiful, those things which transcend all of us, that point us towards God, can just as easily be replaced with anything else. And we can see this, can't we, in the aggressive promotion of the vices and how, and how we, they try to promote those vices as virtues, like the vice of pride, perhaps, of greed, of immorality. The reality is, however, that however these are sugar-coated 
and however they look to us, however liberating and freeing they may seem, what these worldly vices they do is restrict us and entangle us. We never really get to experience that authentic happiness, that authentic blessedness, which allows us to truly flourish, to truly shine, to truly become, make real those beatitudes we heard about a few weeks ago. We only have to look, don't we, at celebrity culture to show and to see this as true. The Lord never fails to show us the way that leads to our real happiness, our real fulfillment in life. But this requires work and commitment, and indeed it requires sacrifice on our part. Man has life and death before him, that reading says. Whichever a man likes better will be given him. Let us be brave and choose the path that leads to life. Let us make our discipleship truly an intentional one. Amen.